So I really just want to highlight that part of our seminar series um, this semester, we're really focusing on the fact that we are really um, celebrating um, the 10th anniversary of our department. Um, and a little bit about today. So we are just super lucky today. We have um, two fantastic speakers that will be joining us today. Um, and this session really focus on NDSU and PH alumni and how they have used their practicum to really jumpstart their career in public health. Um, the session is gonna be moderated by Dr. Mark Strand. Um, Dr. Strand is a professor in the School of Pharmacy and Master of Public Health program here at NDSU. Um, and he works closely with local public health in North Dakota and is committed to really help students prepare to work in the public health field. So to really kind of understand what our practicum is, um, it's really all about um, putting together concepts and competencies in which our students learn um, during that kind of first year or, or um, people, if students kind of spread out that um, program as well, kind of really integrating some of those key concepts that they're learning into a practicum experience. Um, this involves, as you can see, over 240 hours of work. Um, the practicum experience really can be um, tailored to the um, students' individual needs and experiences and what they really want to do when it comes to building building specific skills. Um, but the practicum experience also involves meeting the goals and needs of where these students also conduct these practicum um, experiences. Um, some of the requirements for our NDSU um, practicum. So I'm just briefly covering a few here in this slide. If you guys are interested in, in looking into more in depth of what our practicum requires, um, you can really check that out online. So what it really truly covers is um, identifying five or more um, MPH competencies um, that they really focus in and hone in on when it comes to their own professional goals. Um, and a practicum um, instructor will work closely with each student to really connect those um, competencies with their project objectives and what they will actually fundamentally do and work towards for a, a product and goal. Um, the students also must complete a poster, which really focuses in and hones in on the work they did and helps also to just clarify and, and help them to understand how to present deliverables as well. Some of the strengths of this practicum experience is that we actually have a wide range of practice settings in which students can um, really hone in on their skills. Um, and it really, again, I've said this a couple times, but it's really tailored to the student specific goals and, and what they really see for um, their career and future aspirations in public health. Um, in the next slides, I'll also kind of talk about what some of our students have done and where they've conducted these practicums as well. And it really provides that in invaluable experience for our students to jumpstart their career. We have two fantastic examples today of our students and, and what they're doing now. So some of the locations where our students have conducted their practicums have been at local public health units like Fargo Cass and Clay County, um, the state health departments in North Dakota and Minnesota, tribal health units, and also a numerous um, international experiences as well, just to name a few. And um, some of the projects that our students have engaged in include participating in policy analysis and recommendations, really assisting with drafting bills and creating infographics and promotional material, and also um, being involved in program evaluation and grant writing and collecting data and analyzing that data as well. So I am going to now stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Strand. Very good. Thank you, Lauren. And welcome everyone to today's uh, public health seminar series event. It's a special day with two of our alumni who are now working out in the community. And so welcome Maddie and, and Jackie. Uh, Jackie Hawk has multiple degrees and licensures, uh, most notably her Master of Public Health from our program here at NDSU. She also has a Bachelor in Nursing from MSUM and she's an international board certified lactation consultant which she achieved in 2015. Uh, Jackie has worked with patients and families in the NICU, in the adult ICU, and postpartum and lactation settings for 15 years prior to her leadership roles. And currently, she's the inpatient director of the Family Birth Center at Sanford Health 
uh, Sanford Hospital in Fargo. Her passion projects include establishing a breast pump accessory vending machine in her local hospital, as well as a human milk donation and outreach center. Uh, Jackie will be presenting first, but I would like to introduce Maddie at the same time in order to uh, save time in transition. So welcome Maddie, Maddie Vergas. Uh, has also has multiple degrees, uh, including a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Jamestown in 2017, and then she worked as a nurse at Sanford for a time. She then accepted a position at Fargo Cass Public Health as a reproductive health nurse in 2019, and after receiving her Master of Public Health from NDSU, she accepted the Ryan White case manager position and has been working in this position for about four months. Uh, Madison's practicum focused on stigma connected to HIV and how it affects testing and treatment. For those who are unaware, the Ryan White program is providing uh, subsidized funded care for individuals with HIV. Uh, one of her biggest goals was to break down the stigma of HIV by reiterating that HIV is just another chronic illness. Although it's not curable, there are treatment options that are highly effective. Maddie's made a handout that helped capture HIV in North Dakota. Uh, as a resource for communities. And, and this shows that those living with HIV are not alone while they're also educating about what HIV is, how it is spread, how it is not spread, and other key information that can help break down the stigma surrounding HIV. So welcome, both of you. Uh, first, we'll turn it over to Jackie to do her presentation for about 15 minutes. And then Maddie will follow up with another about 15 minutes and then a 15 minute Q&A session after that. You're free to enter your questions into the chat as, as they're presenting and I'll be monitoring that. You're also free to pose questions at the end by using the hands raised feature. So uh, look forward to these presentations and Jackie, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Strand. Okay, let me make sure that, is my presentation showing up correctly? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Yeah, yes, it is. Thanks. Okay, so um, my name is Jackie, inpatient director of the Family Birth Center. I received my MPH in 2019, which feels like 100 years ago, but <laughs> it wasn't. Um, so for my practicum experience, um, like Dr. Strand had said, my um, the majority of my professional focus has been on maternal child health with some other things kind of scattered in there. Um, and for and specifically on the inpatient side. So I wanted something a little bit different from my practicum experience. So I um, worked with the North Dakota legislator, um, Representative Carla Hansen, and this was um, work to create a lactation consultant licensure bill um, that the intention was to bring it to the state legislature. Um, Carla had agreed to sponsor it. So that was where the project started. So why did I choose health policy? As we all know, health is political, right? Um, as I was getting my MPH, I, I found an interest in policy that I never really had felt a connection with before. Um, and part of it was realizing, even having been a nurse for years and years, not realizing what differences there were with nurse education and licensure, you know, prior to some standardizations that have happened to now, um, and how health policy directly impacts patient outcomes. And I also wanted something out of my comfort zone. So again, I had been living in the inpatient setting for years and I really needed something that helped me um, bring a little bit of a different focus um, to the operational side of things. Um, Medicaid had expanded its maternal child coverage to include lactation care, but the language was very vague and trying to decipher how to assure level of care and reimbursement was an issue. Um, and so the bill, the work with the bill came from um, taking a look at what our current issues were within the state and then what was happening outside in other states to figure out um, what would be the most beneficial. So just to give a little bit of a background, yes, I'm a um, board certified lactation consultant. It, it, it was a pretty intensive certification and there are, just like nursing was lots and lots of years ago, there was a lot of different ways to get a nursing degree um, and there wasn't a lot of consistency with how that was being done. And when we're talking in a um, maternal child setting, a lot can go sideways in a hurry with a newborn. 
So the really looking at, um, is there a way to assure level of care? Um, and then of course, reimbursement, because we need people to be able to get reimbursed for the work that they're doing. So that's where this um, started. So this was, how do I write a bill? I did not know that. Um, I Luckily, there's there's resources. You know, there's different drafts. Um, there's templates. Um, it was a little bit less complicated than I was expecting. Still nerve-wracking. But there is resources um, to kind of lead you through that. And Representative Hansen was fantastic. And ultimately, what happened? So... Um, Three states prior had enacted a similar lactation consultant practice act. Um, and as I, we were kind of getting ready, um, you know, the next session was gearing up. There were a lot, there was a lot of controversy with one of the states in particular, Georgia, who had some legislation and the arguments, and this has been ongoing for years. There has still been arguments surrounding this um, that does it limit care access to care in rural areas because again maintaining or getting this licensure and certification is cost prohibitive it's time sensitive um, it's all of these things that are we taking away capability for people to get care if they're not able to maintain get this um this level of licensure and so it highlighted very much the need to consider all potential consequences and i think back to some of my coursework in the mph program and really doing that community assessment, like, yes, this could be a need, but what are unintended consequences to any of the licensure or any of the legislation? We need to take a look at any and all avenues of what this could potentially do, right? So we wanted to make sure that this has um, the, it provides the support we need it to provide, but also doesn't inhibit things in a rural healthcare setting because that can be um, really tricky. So ultimately um, decided that that was not something that we felt comfortable bringing forward at that time because we would kind of wanted to see how the other states played out and maybe get some data surrounding it. Um, and so it was decided that we hold off on it. I still have the draft of the bill and, and now I think it could be expanded potentially for including some other maybe different tiers of licensure. So maybe there's other um, um, certifications that we can include that would ultimately help patients still get care, um, but it would just enhance the field versus limiting the field, um, if that makes sense. And so what do I do now? Um, so I'm the inpatient director of the, the Family Birth Center. So I oversee the labor and delivery postpartum lactation. So it's still within my realm very much within my realm. Um, I took this position about two weeks before COVID hit. So it's been a little bit of a wild ride this whole time, <laughs> I will say. Um, and how has the practicum helped me? Um, so a couple of things have really helped. It, it helped me understand policy changes. So my role is a little bit more of a big picture now than it was when I was a bedside nurse. Um, so understanding policy changes at the federal and state level and how that affects our, the care that we're giving. So it helped me become a little bit more well-versed in what that looked like and what I need to pay attention to. Um, and then anticipating potential impacts of health policy changes. So I have, you know, like I said, I took this role two weeks before COVID hit. So that was like a fire hose of information for all of us, right? Um, trying to figure out what it all meant. I actually remember emailing Dr. Strand at one point because, um, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember thinking, oh, epidemiology is very interesting, but I wonder how I would ever use this in the inpatient world. And then COVID hit and I was like, ha, thanks for making me do the work because <laughs> it ended up being really important. Um, so along with that, you know, we had the recent changes with the Roe v. Wade that has had a big impact and really had to figure out how to how to interpret that language correctly and make sure that we're following the law but still providing good patient care and and really trying to minimize harm in any way that we can. Um, and then another thing that has come from it is understanding the policies around telemedicine and how that had to change during COVID um, because we needed to look at our different care models and how to get reimbursed for them and how to get care for people that did not have access. Um, and then ultimately looking into like a systems thinking, you know, looking at the big picture, looking at 
the ripple effect of everything. Um, and so all of those things relate to my current job, I feel like on a daily basis. Um, and, and I really, I feel like I talked kind of fast, but what sort of questions does everybody have? Um, yeah, you definitely used your time well. And uh, <laughs> originally we had time, so we were going to save questions for the end. But if there were some questions regarding Jackie's presentation, we could take a few minutes to address those now while the topic is on the table and it's in people's minds. So feel free to raise your hand or enter a question into the chat if there's anything you'd like to clarify. So could could you reiterate, Jackie, where the policy you you know proposal you had had at the beginning? Where is that issue at in our state currently? So we decided not to bring that particular one forward. There have been other. Um, uh, breastfeeding bills that that were brought forward that um, that were um, much more focused on access to um, space to feed baby, um, access to lactation care, that kind of thing. But as far as licensure, that piece of it is not in our current our, our current legislature. And that ultimate decision was to hold off to make sure that it wasn't going to have a negative effect and unintended consequence for limiting care to people. Uh, because it's the opposite of what we want to happen, right? We want more people to have access to the care that they need um, and to, again, get reimbursed for the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we move on to the second presentation? Hey, Jackie, this is um, Mary Larson. Hi. Is it okay if I ask my question, Mark? Yes, if you can. There's one more in the chat, which I'll get after you, but go ahead, Mary. Okay. Jackie, you mentioned um, implementing a, a vending machine kind of policy within Sanford. How has yeah. that been going? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's been going really well. Um, I That was one of my passion projects. Again, we have a, um, a ter we're a tertiary care center. You know, there, we get people transferred from all sorts of places throughout the tri-state area. And whether it is a, a you know, um, a person, whether their child is in the hospital, whether they are in the hospital, family member, whomever, or whether you're an employee, um, people didn't necessarily have access to the supplies they needed to feed their baby if you forget. And if you've ever been a breastfeeding mom and you forgot like one thing, it's not fun. It's not great. Um, and so we were able to retrofit a, a vending machine, a snack vending machine for breast pump pieces. And I will tell you, again, with different... Um, with the MPH program and having to do presentations and kind of learn how to um, learn how to present your deliverables as you do in your practicum setting, you know, I had to go in front of a board and ask for foundation funds, and it was um, a bunch of older gentlemen who maybe didn't have as much of a um, realization of the needs <laughs> of breastfeeding supplies, and so it really helped me. Uh, get that cell, I will say. And it's been people, we've had people say that they drive up to the hospital because it's right in the entrance in the middle of the night rather than going to a store if they need something. So it's actually been very well received. It's awesome, we'll thank you. Yeah, we'll take one more question and then uh, move on to Maddie's presentation. So uh, Michael Patrick in the chat has asked, how did you start the relationships with legislators to get your practicum going? you know, that, that policy development issue during your practicum? Yeah, well, so I feel like I was a little bit spoiled because my classmate was Gretchen Dobrovich, who's also <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the legislature. Um, and she had some connection and was able to help me out. I was, I was ready to do some, you know, cold calls if I needed to, but I will say, I feel like there's a pretty, a pretty good connection. Um, you know, NDSU is really well respected within our state. So I, I don't know that it would have been uh, a tough sell, but I was I was really lucky to have a connection that at least gave me her information and she was willing to sit down and, and chat with me. So connections are really important. Mm -hmm, they are. Yeah. Jackie, I'm sure there'll be uh, other questions 
about your experience during our Q&A time at the end. And thank you for respecting the time, you know, for using your time well. Uh, and so we're well on schedule here. So we'll turn it over to Maddie. If you'd just like to go ahead and I believe we'll share your presentation. And then if you just wanna start, go ahead. Sounds good. So I, yeah, I think Lauren was gonna say or share my presentation here. Okay, perfect. Um, so my name is Madison Burgess. Um, I graduated with my MPH in 2021 um, in May, or 2022 in May, just um, this last summer. Um, I started working at um, Fargo Cass Public Health about four years ago. Um, I always knew that I wanted to end up in public health. I just didn't know where. Um, so when I accepted this position is when I decided that getting my MPH would be um, kind of the next step. And then it kind of all worked out where once I graduated, I was able to transition to Ryan White. Um, so we can do the next slide. So um, I started, like I said, at Fargo Cast Public Health as a reproductive health nurse. So I worked a lot with um, contraceptives, STDs, and this is kind of where my eyes opened up to HIV. Um, and it kind of showed me how prevalent it is in North Dakota. Um, I helped the previous Ryan White case manager with re-enrollment. We do it every year um, around April. And so that kind of got my foot in the door and showed me how the program works. Um, and then the previous case manager and I, we actually graduated at the same time. Um, she had gotten her NP the same time I got my MPH. So she went to work as a provider. Um, and then I was able to just transition into this role. Um, I've been in this position now um, since September. So about four months or so. Um, and a uh, master's isn't required for this position, but um, I personally feel like I've been able to do a much better job in this position because of my um, MPH. Um, my biggest role as a Ryan White case manager is to just break down barriers for those living with HIV. Um, so right now I have about 185 clients um, in the Cass County area that I work with. Um, and being able to do my practicum, it, it actually worked out perfectly because I focused on barriers that people might have with HIV care, getting tested, getting treatment. Um, and it just was able to open my eyes to something that I use every single day. Um, HIV is a public health issue just because it, it can be spread publicly. Um, so knowing that I get to help just an individual stay on their medication and it in turn is gonna help all of um, like the Fargo Cass area um, is, is great. Um, so we can go on to the next slide where I can kind of talk about my practicum a little better. So um, the, it was a paper and the name was um, HIV stigma and how it affects testing and treatment. And then I looked at it at a sociological approach. Um, so I was able to see um, every level of like when a new, um, a new diagnosis comes in, um, I can kind of break it down at every level and see where their needs are. Um, there's a lot of internal stigma that happens with HIV. Um, almost this idea that people deserve to have HIV because of like a lifestyle they had or because of choices they made, but that's really not the case at all. Um, like Dr. Strand had said before, um, I use the phrase that HIV is just like any other chronic illness. Um, we never say that somebody deserves to have diabetes because they um, didn't exercise or didn't eat well. Um, that would just be absurd. So um, breaking down that internal stigma is sometimes one of the hardest things um, because people feel ashamed of this diagnosis and there's no need, there's no need for that. Um, the stigma of um, like the internal stigma that people feel does sometimes follow through with the family, friends and cultural structural um, at the community level. Um, but one of the biggest things that I saw was the, the stigma of how HIV is spread. Um, so even to this day, like I still chat with people who say that, aren't you afraid to be with those clients in the same room? Like, aren't you afraid you're gonna get HIV? And that's just not how it works. That's not the case at all. Um, so just having people realize that these people out in the community and um, in everyday life should be treated just as anybody else um, is something that I really try and push for. Um, 
The policy level has been something, it's been fun seeing it from this side, um, not really any something, not something that I ever paid attention to. Um, but the policy level has gotten better. Um, and the fact that I feel like we've gotten more accepting of HIV and realizing that it's just like a chronic illness, public health issue, and the more people in treatment, the better it is. it's an outcome for everybody. Um, so the Ryan White program is federally funded. So it's throughout the entire US, every state has their own. Um, and so that's you know a policy that had to go through um, to allow us to have this type of program. Um, and then another big one is the U equals U, which um, you guys might have heard of. Basically it's um, undetectable equals untransmittable. So once somebody is on medication and they become undetectable, there is virtually no risk of transmitting it to anybody else. Um, one thing that is still a big deal with, um, with the policy level though, that's still a barrier um, is blood donation. Um, MSM or men who have sex with men are not able to donate blood um, for I believe it's up to three months after they've had a sexual encounter um, with risk of, of um, them being HIV positive. And when we're in a time where there's such a blood shortage um, that just kind of um, reiterates the stigma that comes along with it that um, everyone who's MSM has HIV which is completely not the case. Um, and then another policy that's in the works of trying to get turned over actually um, is having to disclose your status um, when you're having um, any sort of sexual relation. So um, it's kind of a tough one because it's, it's you can look at it from both sides, um, but at the end of the day, if somebody is undetectable, they're untransmittable, and there's no law that's saying that you have to disclose any other STD before having intercourse. Um, is it a good thing to do? Yes, but it's not um, controlled by the law. So that's another policy that's kind of um, in the works of getting turned over. And um, I believe it's the end of this month. It's going um, to the court to see where they stand with that. Uh, we can do the next slide. So this was one of my deliverables. Um, it's a handout that I made and it's broken up into different pieces so that we can see it better. Um, but it's just like a rack card that I use as a brochure. Um, and basically the goal was to um, show all these different steps and um, basically sh give it to people who are new diagnosis, but also to people who are still in the program. Um, so when somebody comes in and they're just got this news that they're HIV positive, I like to give them this just to kind of give a breakdown. Um, it talks about what HIV is, um, what it's going to be like to live with HIV. Um, and then it also touches on the Ryan White program. So everybody who gets this brochure is typically already connected to the program, but it's something that we have to re-enroll every year. Um, and so we want to make sure that those who are in the program remain in the program and that any new diagnoses get connected to the program. Um, I think it's something like 89% of people in the Ryan White program are undetectable. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, it's a huge thing, especially um, just like the cost at the very basic level of it. Um, right now, North Dakota is implementing a wage cap. Um, for the longest time, we were fortunate enough to accept everybody. Um, and now we have a wage cap, which is unfortunate um, and not something that anybody is happy about. Um, but it's 500% above poverty. So, I mean, it's a good it's a good cap, um, but it's just difficult because um, like today I had a client who couldn't get her medications because they cost $3,700 a month and insurance only covered $600 of that. So Ryan White would come in and be able to cover the rest. But if she wasn't on Ryan White, she, you know, nobody has $3,100 to, to spend on medication. Um, so it's really important to get people in the program and keep them in the program. Um, we also touch on PrEP, which is that pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, we always recommend that even if you're a partner of somebody who's HIV positive and they're undetectable, um, we do recommend PrEP just as a, another tool in your tool belt um, to help reduce the risk of transmission. And then I also talk about um, North Dakota's living with HIV, just to basically give a snapshot um, and show that it's not one type of person that has HIV. Um, there's not, you know, it's, it doesn't discriminate. Um, and it's important to see that if you're a white female, you're not the only white female in North Dakota that has HIV. You're not alone in this. Um, 
and it's not something that you need to feel bad about. We can go to the next slide. Um, and then this is just the back of that handout. Um, so it just talks about tips for preventing HIV. Um, there's many ways that you can, of course, being on medication is um, the best way, but um, there's also um, other tips that you can take to help prevent the spread. Um, and then we talk about how it spreads and how it does not spread. Um, that's probably one of the most important things on this um, handout, just to show, again, these people should be treated as anybody else um, in the community, any normal person. Um, and then we also do the U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. Um, typically, it takes about a month to become um, undetectable with medications. It's very fast. Um, and as long as you stay on your medication, take your medication daily, um, you'll remain untransmittable or undetectable, and then you won't be able to spread it to anybody. Um, they're also coming out with medications that are like a um, once every two months injection, um, and they're hoping to, to get that to like once a year. Um, and then we're also getting to that seven year mark where hopefully we'll be able to have generic medications um, to help with the cost of that. And then, um, so basically um, my practicum really helped me see all these barriers. Um, I, I see these barriers every day. And I think without my practicum and without digging deep into the stigma that comes with it, um, I don't know that I would have the, the lens to see where these clients are coming from. Um, it showed me that there's more to HIV than just the medical portion. So it's not just getting your medications and calling it good. There's so much more that goes into it. Um, and seeing those barriers really helped me um, look beyond just, okay, let's get your medications and call it good. Um, there's a whole lifestyle change that comes with HIV. Um, and being able to do my practicum allowed me to understand um, like why this client is having a difficult problem and what the next step is to, to make it so that they don't have to have a difficult time with HIV. Um, so yeah, I guess that's all. Excellent. So any questions for Maddie's introduction to her practicum experience and her current work with Ryan White? I don't have a question, but just more of a comment. I love the breakdown of the demographics to show, you know, that again, you're not the only one that I think that that is an important piece. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Maddie, what is the status currently on our understanding of whether the U equals U also applies to needle trans you know transmission is that is it also the case that undetect undetectable is untransmissible through needle exposure bes besides sexual exposure i'm you know familiar with the former but the latter i know has been a, an issue of some debate mm -hmm. um so it is the same um so once you're undetectable it's untransmittable through um needles through sex um through any mode of transportation um transmission mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the with prep though prep is more um effective through um sexual than it is through needles and i think it's just because um through needles there's just that higher chance of of contracting hiv since it is blood to blood um given that this is a uh, you know focusing on the practicum experience and i see quite a few students on actually and I was wondering if either of you or both would like to respond to a couple of questions that came to mind. You know, one was, um, you know, choosing a practicum site and what to think about in choosing a site. Another was, you know, how how are the competencies for the program that have to be, you know, demonstrated in the practicum? How are they evaluated, chosen? And do you have any experience or guidance on that? Um, so those are two questions I have just about the practicum experience for the benefit of our students. Uh, who are on the on the call? Um, for me, it was really nice because I worked at Fargo Cass. Um, but I know that like Fargo Cass Public Health has so many different um, like portions of like what they do. They have the clinic, we have um, immunizations, we've got um, environmental health, um, just so many different parts of it that um, I think that 
they would be open to having people come for practicum. So I would definitely just say to reach out um, and start there. Um, and then as far as the competencies go, um, I kind of had a hard time with that. Um, once I got towards the end, I went back and looked at my competencies and saw like that I hit a few of them, but then there was a few that I hadn't chosen that I'd hit. Um, and once you choose your competencies, that's like what you have, you, you don't get to change them. Um, so one thing that I think would be like a good reminder is to just keep looking at those competencies through your whole practicum um, and making sure that if you have to switch a little something um, just to do that, because they're not, they're not like unattainable by any means. Um, there's a lot of ways to hit one competency. So probably just keep looking at them and um, adjust as needed. I would say the same, just keep an eye on the competencies and read through them um, because you'd be surprised how many of them you hit. Um, and then as far as choosing, I touched on it a little bit. You know, I specifically wanted something outside the box. Uh, it, it's not super common for an inpatient nurse to go the MPH route. I feel like <laughs> there's not a ton. And so it was looking at how, how, and since then I have found that it applies in nearly every aspect of my job, but in the beginning it was, um, okay, how, how can this be applicable to both my public health world and my inpatient world and um policy was something that I felt could potentially make a really big impact and understanding policy honestly that was one of the biggest things is is this helped me understand policy a little bit better um, because that is huge all right we have a question in the chat knowing what you know now, what would you, and you answered this in part, so just if you want to add anything to it, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently in selecting your practicum and then getting the most out of it? Ooh, I, I, that is hard for, I don't know that I would do anything differently because even though, like I said, the bill we chose not to bring forward at the very end, um, went through all the steps up until that point, but honestly, that was kind of important for me to do as well and to see that maybe not everything is appropriate to bring forward um, because you have to look at the systems thinking big picture what's my unintended consequences that type of thing so I don't know if I would I, I don't feel like I would do anything differently um I probably would have started my handout process a little earlier like my deliverable mm -hmm. um, just because what I handed in at the end of the practicum is not what I have now. Um, it's the same information, but like the layout and everything's different just because it has to match Fargo CAS. Um, so like it has to go through our marketing team. Um, so, I mean, maybe that, maybe the deliverable, but at the same time, it's hard to do that if you don't have all the information from your practicum. So, Did each of you do it in a intensive six week 240 hours all straight on or did you spread it out over time because I think there's some flexibility there as well if I remember right I think I again this feels like a hundred years ago and yesterday at the same time um, <laughs> I think I did an intensive version and that was what worked for me with my I mean I had a full-time job and a husband and children and so for me I needed to like set aside some focused time that's what worked mm -hmm. best for my schedule. Um, I did mine in like parts um, and mostly because the work that I did every day, um, like if at any point it would help me in my practicum, um, that's something I would do. And then when I was helping with re-enrollment, um, any questions that helped like with my current position was something that I could use for the practicum as well. So it overlapped really nicely. Okay, another question about selecting the the uh, practicum, and this is a really good question from Mohammed. Um, as far as I understand, and Mohammed comes from a medical training background, and so it may pertain to the selection issue here, so I'll just read it. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand, there's not a sort of platform for us to seek the practicum, like a match system, um, mm -hmm. but it's more like a personal connection and search. And first, would you confirm that that's true? or not? And then do you know any platform for grad students to use certain keywords or search words, please? I guess maybe the question, are there tips and tricks to enhance those, those personal connections if you don't have those existing already? That is an excellent question. Um, 
there is not a match system like there is in the in medical training side of things. Um, and I know for me, it was a connection that definitely was helpful um, in, in choosing my practicum. So I don't know if I have a great answer. I feel like there are um, different social media sites where you can, you know, kind of like list serves. Um, and I know I've been approached, like since been, I've been in this role, I've been approached different types of students um, and, and gotten emails of, from people I didn't know saying like, hey, can, is there any education opportunities for X, Y, and Z? And I'm always, I always really try hard to honor those. Um, but I'm curious to see what Madison says, because I don't think that there's a, like an official platform. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, like I said, it worked out for me because I work here. Mm -hmm. um, definitely like connections, which it's hard if you if you don't have them, um, especially international students. Mm -hmm. um, I know like a student in my program, he was in um, like Egypt for a while. So like, how do you um, make any sort of connection? Um, but I do think for some reason, it seems like Fargo Cast Public Health is like this hidden secret in Fargo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, agreed. Yep. Yeah, so I think just like reaching out um, to anybody at Fargo Cast, um, whether that's me or anybody else, um, we're, we're pretty well connected where like the email will get to the person where it's supposed to go to um, or their boss or something. Um, so I would maybe start there. And plus my, um, my, um, what, like the, what's preceptor? it called? Preceptor? Yeah. Yep. My preceptor um, really helped me find um, good places and ideas and kind of kept me on track. So they might be a good resource. Um, okay. They've been doing and it for a while. I would also say classmates. So one of my very favorite things about the program was that there were people from so many different um, areas of the world, different industries, different experiences. Um, you know, there was people in harm reduction, people like myself in inpatient. There, people were from all over. And so I, I also feel like bouncing ideas off of your classmates, um, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's also a resource that I found very valuable. But as I'm hearing this, there are a lot of assumptions being built in here. And I think, so I think Muhammad's question is something we definitely want to keep in mind moving forward. And mm -hmm. it was actually followed up on by Rhoda, whose comment that I agree with Muhammad, it's difficult for international students to get a practicum site, especially of interest. So mm -hmm. maybe uh, without the prior connections or maybe less familiarity with the systems, it's harder to even know where you start looking for a personal connection. I think this is a probably an area that we would could do better on. And Mary Larson has added in, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to your advisors. So for students on this call, talk to your advisors early about these opportunities to just become familiar with some, some of those opportunities. Um, Ramona, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, and I can just mention my comment as well that uh, I think Dr. Meyer is the, <clears throat> the person who coordinates all of our practicums is a, is a wealth of information in terms of yeah. places that have been practicum, practicum sites in the past or are currently willing to be. Um, and then I think even all of our alumni um, you know, that's a whole network that's potentially available to us as well in terms of all the, um, you know, really great places that alumni are working. Um, so I don't wanna take the conversation away from this really rich conversation about um, the practicum. Um, I did have a comment about policy. Uh, Gretchen Doberwitz is um, a graduate of our program just in the last year as well. And um, as Jackie mentioned, um, that, that was um, a real asset <laughs> to have her in the program and um, was the connection for her in her practicum. What Gretchen did for her integrated learning experience was write testimony specifically and an infographic, you know, an educational um, about amending the North Dakota Century Code. And I'm just wondering if this comes up at all in your work, Madison, um, and if this is maybe what you were referring to. It was um, a Century Code. 12.1-20-17, but that knowingly transmitting the HIV virus to another person is a sex crime in class A felony. And that um, it's really, a, you know, came out of the 1980s and 90s when there was so much fear um, and unknown um, about, you know, transmission and the intent really was to protect the public. But 
uh, her argument is that it's actually, you know, potentially a deterrent for people to even want to go out and get tested. And, and then um, if they were to repeal that specific part of the century code that it would then become the way all other sexually transmitted infections and potentially fatal infectious diseases um, are addressed, which, um, you know, so there's already there's already a, a code there to accommodate that. It would just be instead of it being its own class and being a felony, it would be the way other sexually transmitted infections are handled. So just curious if um, if this comes up or um, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, yep. That's exactly the um, the code that they're looking to overturn, um, and it's tough because, like, from an outside point of view, um, it's easy to say like well, if I'm going to have sex with someone and they have HIV, like they need to tell me that they have that. But looking at it from a public health lens um, with the idea that it's virtually impossible to transmit it once you're undetectable um, and that changing the law, it's still like the client still needs to be responsible for their HIV, um, be in treatment, you know, use protection, use other barriers. Um, it's, it wouldn't make it just a free for all. Um, you know, to just go and spread HIV to everyone, which nobody is doing anyways. Um, so I think it's a, it's definitely a good thing to look at. Um, and something that didn't really hit me until I was in the, the Ryan White program. Um, and it's also difficult because like, we've had clients who come in their new diagnosis, and then their partner comes in and their new diagnosis. And we know that this person gave it to this person. But we can't, like we as um, the Ryan White case managers can't say like, this person gave it to you. Like, what do you wanna do? You know, are you gonna do legal charges or anything? Um, so it's really like, it's almost like, why do we have that, that law in place? When is it used? When does it actually go um, into effect? And it's just doing more harm than good. Like you had said, it's stopping people from finding out their status. Um, and which in term is, is harmful because now they're gonna spread it if they have it um, and it's gonna affect them personally with their health. Um, so just getting rid of that um, is I think something that, that would do more good than any sort of harm that other people outside of the HIV world might, might argue. Thank you for commenting on that. And um, I just put in a link um, I just searched who was Ryan Wright. Well, Ryan White, because not everybody might realize um, who he was, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm of the age where I grew up with him. Um, he was just a few years older than me. And um, um, I know he and Elton John were buddies, but he was mm -hmm. just an amazing, um, an amazing, um, yeah, it was a complicated time, but um, to be a young child, um, he really helped open up people's eyes about um, taking away some of the, the stereotypes, um, negative stereotypes that there were around the disease at the time, so. Yeah, absolutely. Do we have, do we have other questions from the participant, for the participants? We have just a, another couple minutes here. Hi, Dr. Strand, it's Amanda. I cannot find the raise my hand button on my Zoom for some odd reason, but that's, I do have a question okay. for Maddie. Um, so I recently transitioned into our one of our HIV STI outreach coordinator positions with NDSU. And one of the goals in that position is to um, increase provider awareness um, in prescribing for HIV PrEP. And I'm just wondering, do you have any data or any thoughts um, when interacting with your clients on whether they were screened appropriately or asked the right questions when interacting with providers in their sexual health histories? Um, and if the right questions were asked, that might have made them a great candidate for HIV prep prior to their HIV diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, screen everybody for prep um, through FargoCast through our clinic. Um, and our questioning system, um, we basically we ask if have you heard of prep, um, and we started by saying we ask everybody this. Um, so it's not just you. Um, have you heard of prep? And if they have, we kind of chat about a little bit. If they haven't, then we explain what it is. Um, a medication that drastically reduces your risk of contracting HIV. Um, we usually do it at the end of the interview. So our interview process is like pretty invasive um, since we focus on reproductive health. Um, so by this point, we know like how many partners they've had, what type of sex they have, um, who their partners are. 
um, things like that. So we can kind of tailor how we talk about it. Um, but the CDC doesn't have any, so they have recommendations on who should be on it, um, but there's no like limit on who should be on it. If somebody who has very low risk factors still wants to be on PrEP, the C CDC recommends it. Um, but we usually focus on, like I say, if somebody doesn't know what it is um, and they're wondering like, would this be a good fit for me? Um, I say that we usually recommend it for men who have sex with men, IV drug users, um, people who are having sex with like multiple partners and not using condoms, don't know um, other people's status, or um, if your partner is HIV positive, we would recommend that you be on PrEP. Um, so it just kind of opens the door to um, the conversation. Um, and it's not, I don't know that it's so much, like finding who should be on it is super important. Um, and like pushing it is important, um, but showing that it's like, it's like, a, it's a, an amazing drug. Um, it's kind of unattainable for some people with the cost and everything. Um, which we have it here at FargoCast for super cheap if, if anybody is, uh, wants to plug that. But um, it's definitely something that if you want it, you should be on it. Um, and if you have those specific like four or five risk factors, it should definitely be more of an in-depth conversation um, with a provider. But I think, um, I mean, it's tough because I think we recommend testing for HIV like <coughs> once between the ages of like 14 and 64 if you have normal risk factors, um, which is not sufficient enough, I think, personally. Um, but I think first is um, getting like the, the testing, we should be testing more, um, but then also getting like with the testing, we need to be partnering that, that prep conversation with it as well, um, I think is a good place to start. And I, if I can piggyback on that a little bit, I think something that you alluded to or that we've talked about a little bit that I keep hearing come up is that stigma can really inhibit best practice. And so changing the language to be really just consistent and objective helps our patients get the care that they need. Um, and I know, I mean, I can remember like now HIV is a normal maternal pre like prenatal lab. It's within the lab panel that everybody gets. That wasn't always the case. And actually that was kind of a battle right away um, because it was, well, how do we present this to patients that we're doing this to everybody, you know, but it's way easier when it's like, this is a standard of care. We test everybody just to make sure that we can provide the best care possible versus trying to pick and choose who to test, right? It doesn't make sense. So I think, again, so much of public health work is to reduce stigma so we can provide best practices and give the care that everybody needs. Excellent. Well, if our uh, attendees could use your reactions button to provide a round of applause or just <laughs> show your appreciation for our presenters today. Thank you, Madison and Jackie, for your contributions to, to the today's public health seminar. And so with that, I'd like to turn it back to Lauren to wrap up today's <laughs> seminar series. Yes, thank you, Dr. Strand, for um, excellently moderating the session, and Madison and Jackie for your incredible insight. Um, I think we had some really great questions, and we really appreciate everyone that attended today. I'm going to kind of wrap up today with just some follow-up slides with some of the things we've talked about. And um, before I share my presentation, I also am sending links to all of our future seminars for this um, for this semester. Um, if you're interested, I'm just putting on um, the titles of each of these events, um, when we'll be having it and the link um, to register as well. So I'm just throwing that in before I, I share my screen again. Let's see here, trying to find the right one here. This way. Everyone see my screen all right? I'm hoping so, okay. Um, so um, I just wanna highlight at the end here. So if you are a participant today and you might be interested in actually becoming a practicum site for our students, we wanted to share who you should contact within our department. So um, I know we briefly mentioned her today, but Dr. Stephanie Meyer um, is your contact for that. And I just wanted to provide her email and phone um, information as well in case this might be of interest to you. 
Also, we just want to talk about, like I said, I put it in the chat, but what our future um, seminars will be this um, semester. Again, we're really trying to highlight our students, talk about what they're doing, some of the what is public health and, and what does it look like for our students um, when they graduate. Um, and really, um, we'll be kind of filling out at the end of the semester with a round table um, and really having some of our faculty and staff and talking about what public health is in our lives now and what it is in the future. That will be in April. So again, if you are interested in any of these sessions, um, please check out the links in our chat to register and you'll get a calendar invite through your um, email that you use to register. Um, lastly, I want to highlight that um, we are online, so if you are interested in learning more about our um, department and what we do, what our students are doing, um, please check us out on all of the following links. Um, we're on, um, we have our website, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and we also have a LinkedIn profile as well. Um, and finally, we're just celebrating our um, 10 years anniversary here at the department. And I want to, again, thank you all for particip part participating today. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please reach out to us. Um, we will also be posting the recording of this session on um, the YouTube channel as well. So if you are interested and want that recording, again, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, so I guess that's all I have today. And thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, on a Friday um, to really hear from some of our excellent students. So thank you so much.